Coming up on DTNS, a virtual whammy bar for your guitar and keyboard, a pair of leaks for both Apple and Android fans, and Microsoft warns that the solar winds attackers are still at it. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 28th, 2021. We made it. In Los Angeles, California, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories in Cleveland, I'm Lynn Peralta. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, we were just talking about Mosquito Lake and the size of Juno on Good Day Internet. If you would like that expanded conversation, get the show. Go to patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google Photos will end unlimited free storage for photos and videos starting June 1st, after which time new photos and videos that you upload will count towards the free 15 gigabytes of storage that comes with every Google account. But photos or videos that you've already uploaded will not count towards that cap. So consider this your cue to upload those photos and videos now before they start counting. Google wrote out a new free tool to help you manage your storage and Google One subscriptions start at $2 per month in the US for 100 gigs of storage. 10 year old consumer advocacy group Stop the Cap examined pricing for Spectrum customers in Rochester, New York. It found that customers who lived in neighborhoods where Frontier and Greenlight offered fiber internet service, you were offered 400 megabit per second Spectrum service for $30 a month. However, if there were no competitive services at your address, in other words, if Spectrum was your only option, the cost was $70 a month for 400 megabits per second. Price guarantees are longer in competitive areas and installation costs are cheaper there as well. These are promotional prices, not your ongoing price, and Charter, which runs Spectrum, told Ars Technica that non-promotional Spectrum prices are consistent within each market. India's Tata Sons has acquired a majority stake in India's Big Basket Grocery Delivery Service. Big Basket works with more than 12,000 farmers directly to deliver fresh fruit and vegetables. It will fit in as one element in a planned Tata Super app that could also include Cure Fit Fitness app that Tata is also looking to acquire. And yeah, making a super app now. After a one-month delay, Rivian announced its R1T electric pickup and R1S SUV deliveries will start in July. Company plans to contact everyone with a launch edition pre-order by November and hopes to complete all launch edition deliveries by next spring. Updates for the R1T and R1S include a now standard onboard air compressor, a now optional off-road upgrade with new adventure gear options and an 11.5 kilowatt hour home wall charger. Rivian says offers 40 kilometers of range for every hour of charging time. I really want that R1S. Oh, do I want it? Maybe someday, never. The US FBI announced that foreign actors breached the network of a local US municipal government using an unpatched vulnerability in a Fortinet VBPN appliance that the FBI had issued a warning about back in April. Once on the network, the attacker created a backdoor account named Ellie, then later created further backdoor accounts on domain controllers, servers, workstations, and active directories. All right, let us talk about the App Store. But not really. When you list an app in the Apple App Store, developers list what kinds of in-app purchases are available and how much they'll cost. That helps you evaluate the ongoing cost of using an app. If you're like, well, it's free to download, but I'm going to have to pay $3 for the Twitter Blue subscription, for instance. You'll want to know that before you download it. Twitter now lists a $2.99 a month Twitter Blue subscription under in-app purchases in its iOS App Store description although the feature does not appear to be live in the actual app. However, app researcher, and may I call her magician, Jane Manchin Wong, says she has been able to become the first paying customer, and Twitter Blue comes with color themes, custom app icons, undo send, and a collections feature. You can, you know, favorite things and keep them in a particular collection so you can organize your favorites. So she became the first paying customer not just because she happened to be the first person that noticed this. I right? the implication is that she figured out how to how to create an how account. How to become a paying yeah. customer. I got to say that. I'm a little underwhelmed by what you apparently are offered for $3 a month for Twitter. You know, the big one is the undo send, right? I don't really see how this is much different than deleting a tweet. If I compose a tweet, I say tweet, 
I realized within, I, I believe the last I heard was Twitter would allow a delay of up to 30 seconds, kind of like the undo send, you know, in an email client. You know, if I realize it that closely and I'm paying for the undo send feature, then I can be like, ah, whoosh, ah, I don't want anybody to see that. I feel stupid kind of thing. But anything beyond that, I would just have to delete the tweet. So it's, I don't know, you know, changing a color of my Twitter experience Maybe it would be nice, not something I'm clamoring for. Uh, I, I I wonder who wants to buy this package. It makes a little bit of sense to me. I know a lot of people who like have grammatical errors that they figure out later and they might want to use the undo send for that. But again, you would have to notice that like right after you send that tweet. For me, this would be super useful if they let you edit tweets. For example, if you had a really engaging tweet and you were linking out to a very specific thing like a YouTube video or maybe a blog or a news article or something that you wrote, it would be nice if there was a change in that link, you could change that link afterwards. Like that kind of editing ability, that would be nice. I realize why they don't put it there because they a, a lot of places use news or use Twitter as a part of their news articles or news outlets. So there is a reason why editing doesn't exist, but that would be the only thing that would really make me like say, hey, I would totally pay for this. If I could force other people to see like a pink profile on my page, I don't I don't think that would be worth three bucks. I, you, you can do all of this with other things, you know, with third party apps and extensions and, and things like that. Granted, it's sometimes worth paying yeah. for something to make it easy so that you don't have to go do it yourself and you can get the stock experience and all that. I get that. I don't see these four things being worth it for me. Not, not that $3 is too high of a price. They're just not things that I'm that interested in making easy uh, for me. I was hoping they would come out and maybe they still will. I mean, this is just Jane Manchin Wong saying, I figured out what's in here. There might be more things coming. They might also add in more things down the road after they officially launch this. But I was hoping for more creator focused stuff, uh, you know, content subscriptions, yes. things like that. But we'll see. Hey, uh, one more Twitter thing before we get off uh, of Twitter. Eight days after relaunching public applications for verification, uh, Twitter said Friday it is, quote, rolling in verification requests, and they're pausing accepting new applicants uh, while they review the ones that have been submitted, and they hope they'll unpause very soon. So moving on, have I been pwned is this database of usernames slash emails and hashed passwords that let you look up your accounts and see if you have been breached or if your password or username has been leaked anywhere. It's been run by security researcher Troy Hunt for a very long time, and he has co contemplated over the years selling it or otherwise disentangling himself from the application. So in August of 2020, he decided to make it open source and let the community start to manage it. Hunt announced that the code for pwned passwords is now open source and available on GitHub under a BSD3 clause license. So pwned passwords is not the entire Have I Been Pwned API and service. It's basically a feature that allows you to enter your passwords to find out if those were leaked specifically, separate from the email addresses. It receives SHA-1 and NTLM hashed pairs of passwords, and they are never ever stored in plain text in the database. So the data is stored in Azure and it is working with the 501c nonprofit called the .NET Foundation on managing the open source project and .NET has nothing to do with Microsoft in case you were concerned. In addition, the FBI is also going to now add data from breaches discovered during its investigations to help make the database even more comprehensive. The FBI data is also going to be provided to the Pwn Passwords program, and all of that data is also going to be hashed as well with SHA-1 and NTLM. Yeah, I think taking the pressure off Troy Hunt uh, is a long time coming. Uh, this is an incredibly valuable service to the internet to provide. I think the thing that a lot of people wonder, especially if they haven't used it before or they hadn't even heard of it before, is, is it safe for me to enter my password into a database when I'm worried about my password being stolen? Like, how does that work? 
Absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, that's a huge concern. And it's one that I've heard people say, like, is Troy Hunt just basically collecting all of mm -hmm. these passwords? Like, what is he going to do that? Or the same thing with email addresses. Is he going to start spamming everybody who puts their email address into his website? And that's not true at all. Um, so it's basically using this mathematical property to create these hashes which are basically just a whole bunch of generic numbers and letters that are tied to each of these different kinds of passwords. Um, and this is called k-anonymity. So whenever you put in your plain text password into the site, it hashes that and turns it into a string of this SHA-1 slash NTLM hash pair so that uh, it'll it'll match it up and try to figure out if your password was indeed breached without actually sending your plain text password over to the entire database of hashes that are actually stored on the have I been pwned database. So it does keep the data separate and it does keep it uh, anonymous, but the mathematical part of that, uh, it is a little bit confusing, but it does help create that anonymity so everybody is safe if you're entering in those plain text passwords. And when you go to have like, I, oh, go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. It, uh, it sounds like too, for anybody who's like, FBI is involved, hmm. I mean, FBI is just saying, hey, we're gonna add data to this project so that the data is smarter. Yeah, this is data yeah. the FBI is finding, right? And, and yeah. they're sharing hashed versions. They're not, you know, again, they're not handing it over in plain text. Exactly. Yeah, they're they're sending all all of this information over to the Have I Been Pwned Pwned Password database, completely hashed. So even if they did have plain text passwords from any leaks or database breaches or any kind of uh, vulnerabilities that the FBI has found, they're not going to be sending that information over in plain text to this this Pwned Passwords database. Now, uh, I see, uh, who is it here? Soft Boiled Eggy says, you don't enter your password, you enter your email address. If you go to the homepage of haveibeenpwned.com, that is correct. Uh, he, yeah. he wants you to use your email address to see, has your email address been implicated in a breach? But there is a, a function for using passwords, right? Yes, so up at the top, and I'll, I'll direct users to it, uh, there is a link that says passwords. And if you click on that, it's an entire separate database that was included on the Have I Been Pwned website. Back in, I want to believe, I want to say 2017, and there's currently about 600 and 613 uh, billion different passwords that are included in there, or sorry, 613 million that are included in there. So these are all different passwords that were either hashed or plain text that have been included in this database. So you can actually put in your real plain text passwords and find out if those were breached or leaked anywhere along the line. And it won't tell you the accounts, so somebody can't go in trying no. to like figure out like which, which accounts use this password. It'll no. just say, that password has been used in this many breaches, so you probably want to change it. I'll give you an example. I have an old e uh, password that I used to use back before I knew anything about security and privacy. I put that in, and the only thing it will tell you is how many times that password has been leaked in some kind of breach. So it tells me that password has been seen four times before. So I know that's a vulnerable password and I should never use it before, but that's all the information I get. I don't get the email or the username that's tied to it. I don't even get what website it's from for the leak. I just know that the password was yeah. not a good password to use. Well, for anybody who might be feeling a little peckish, we've prepared a duo of product leaks for your entree today. Please sit down, get comfortable. First, Bloomberg chefs Mark Gurman and Debbie Wu have once again teamed up on a fresh Apple AirPods leak. Mmm. Their sources say that Apple released uh, updated, will release updated base model AirPods later this year with a shorter stem. That might be interested to some people. Also a new case design similar to the AirPods Pro. New AirPods Pro themselves are expected next year and will supposedly include fitness-focused motion sensors. Now, as a counterpoint for those with more Android preferred palettes, you might enjoy an analysis of the APK for Google's messages by XDA developers, which found that Google is working on support for pinned messages and bookmarking messages across conversations. It's not clear from the code when or if Google will activate them, though. Uh, 
I long time coming on, on Google Messages. Although I, I don't know that I, I will ever use bookmarking messages on any platform, uh, but pinned messages I have used before. So that that'll be that'll be a nice to have. Shannon, anything in either one of these uh, appeal to your tastes? So even though I have an iPhone, I've never actually purchased one of the uh, pairs of AirPods, and it's specifically because they have those stems. I really wish they would go the route of, for example, the Samsung Galaxy Buds Plus or Pros, uh, because those don't have stems on them, so they don't get caught in my hair. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah. I mean, they've made the stems like shorter with the AirPods Pro, and it sounds like the new AirPods, not Pro, are going to have shorter stems, but they still got to have the stems, still the way they design them. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't like them either, Shannon. I've, I'm using, I use the Jabra's most days, well, one of them for, for this show. And I mean, you can see it. <laughs> I'm not fooling anybody, but uh, yeah, there's something about the dangle that I'm not crazy about either. I will say as far as pinned messages, bookmarking messages, yeah, I'm kind of, I know we're talking about Google messages now, but I struggle to think of two situations where I'd want one or the other. But I can't tell you how many times somebody, like maybe I said, hey, remind me of your address again. I forget how to get to your house. And I know it's in my messages somewhere. And, you know, some keywords sometimes bring it up if I'm trying to, you know, go back maybe up to a year between some message thread between me and somebody else. So pinning things like that would be very nice. Yeah, yeah I, I like the idea of pinning. For example, I had to look up a shipping uh, tracking notification from one of my friends that had texted it to me. And I keep on having to scroll back in the conversation to find it and then copy and paste it into the browser to look up the tracking. It would be nice if I could just pin that so I don't have to scroll back and forth every single time. Hey, folks, really quickly, uh, there's a lot of folks besides just the ones you see and hear on the show uh, who make the show possible. And if you're interested in learning more about them, uh, why not head over to our About Us page? Because we just redesign it. You're going to find links to all the companion shows we do as well. In case you're not aware, we have a Spanish language show. We have one that's deep dives into individual topics. Uh, go check out all the contributors, co-hosts, and related shows like, did you know there's a Live With It? There's a brand new Live With It on Roomba. Uh, you can find it at dailytechnewsshow.com slash about. Microsoft announced that the organization believed to be behind the SolarWinds supply chain attack has been leaked to a malicious email campaign targeting 150 government agencies, research institutions, and other organizations in 24 countries. The attackers compromised the Constant Contact account of USAID, which is a U.S. agency that manages foreign assistance. With that account access, the attackers could send emails that appeared to come from the USAID. Tuesday's emails were sent from USAID accounts to 3,000 different addresses with links to documents on U.S. election fraud. Clicking on the link took the user to Constant Contact, which was then redirected to a server that used JavaScript that caused an automatically downloaded uh, file to an ISO image uh, containing a shortcut to reports, a PDF, and a hidden DLL file. So clicking on reports opened up a PDF and the hidden DLL and the DLL installed a backdoor. So the backdoor enabled persistent access, which of course could be used for getting data, for infecting others on the network. It's pretty worrisome. Most of the emails were marked as spam, but some may have actually gotten through, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, the news here is uh, SolarWinds attackers at it again. And also, let's give them a fifth name because uh, I, I, they, they refer to that organization by so many names. I, I just started talking about them as the SolarWinds attackers. Uh, this is not not a particularly unusual attack, is it, Shannon? I mean, it just tricks you like with, with a, a clickbaity uh, thing. Ooh, election fraud. I want the documents. You get a PDF, so yeah. you think you got the documents. And in the background, you're getting a backdoor installed. Absolutely. Like this is so it's so historical. We, we've always seen, seen attackers use some kind of emotional context to get people to click on spear phishing campaigns. And this is exactly that thing. And in this case, uh, specifically, I did want to point out that Microsoft did say it's anticipating additional activity may be carried out by the group using an evolving set of tactics. And Velexity, which is a security research firm, they also agreed with Microsoft and they they also said the same thing that it's 
entirely possible that a lot of these attacks did indeed get through because they did not see a lot of instances on virus total. So it's definitely something for government organizations and contractors to be on the outlook for uh, because the, these are serious problems that we are currently experiencing in this day and age. Yeah, and it's not like those attackers stopped after December, no. uh, when the solar winds was was discovered, right? Uh, they're, if they're anything, still... this just gave them more intel so that they could do more reconnaissance on the government exactly. agencies. Ah, uh, well, let's switch away uh, from a security story to a music story. Sony has launched an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign, uh, which which it does from time to time, usually in Japan, but this one actually applies to the U.S. and Japan both. It's Motion Sonic. A small capsule that you wear in a rubber band, uh, like a fitness tracker band, you know? Uh, different bands are meant for different things. There's a wristband that's useful for emulating a guitar and one that fits around the back of your hand if you're doing a keyboard. It then uses an iOS app to link your hand motions to musical effects like a delay when you move your finger uh, left to right or maybe pitch adjustment when you roll your wrist. Then if you connect your instrument to an iPhone, and run the music from the instrument through the iPhone, you can implement the effects while you play. So it's it's like a whammy board. Uh, you're playing the guitar, you got this thing on, you're strumming away, and then you like roll your wrist and suddenly you can make vibrato happen in the guitar. Or you're playing the keyboard and you turn your hand over and the pitch goes way up and you can do like some cool effects. Motion Sonic is gonna ship to the US and Japan in March. The first 400 units going for 23,900 yen, which is about $218 US. Uh, after that, it'll retail for 27,200 yen. Uh, but a, a really, really cool way to make it easier to, to do some effects, don't you think? Oh, for sure. And if you watch the, the video that's on the Indiegogo campaign, and the link is in our show notes, you get a much better sense of, oh, wow, this is would be, well, not extremely difficult. If you're a really great musician, You there are other ways to, to make these effects happen, but uh, a very seamless way to make somewhat complicated effects happen. And, you know, I am not musically inclined at all, but it just looks like magic to me. I also, I think my first reaction was also like, well, why Sony doesn't need the money? Why is Sony doing this? Is this more about, hey, we just want to make sure we have a base number of people who want this product totally. rather than this is the money that we'd need to, you know, to go forward? Yeah. It's interest, it's, right? It's that scrappy little startup Sony, man. If we could only scratch together the yen, we would do this product. Definitely. Right. Uh, it's it's a way for them to do prototypes, basically. Yeah, and get and drum up yeah. crowd interest at the same time. Uh, and like I said, they've done it a few times in Japan with products that come out of their experimental research and development labs, where they're like, we don't want to invest the, the amount of money to produce this at scale, but let's let's see if we can get a guaranteed number of people willing to pre-order it, essentially, uh, and then and then that'll justify it. I like the accessibility route of this. Like if you don't have perfect movement in your fingers to be able to do different things with instruments, I feel like this would allow you to still get that same kind of sound, but just by a wave of your wrist, as opposed to, you know, using your fingers rather quickly to be able to create the same kind of sound. So it might be useful from that accessibility uh, for folks that don't have that kind of movement available to them. Yeah, you can you can change like a whammy bar works like a whammy bar, right? And, mm -hmm. and if you if you can't make it work, you can't make it work. But yeah. you could say, oh, I want that effect, but I want it to be a movement that I can make. Uh, mm -hmm. That that's a really interesting way to look at this too. And you know, a few hundred dollars, not super cheap, but uh, it, it's not like above you know beyond the pale as far as somebody who might want to take a flyer on it, especially if you're a musician who who likes to experiment with stuff. I think this would be fun to play with. The only, only downside I can see is that it's not Android compatible at this point. It's only iOS. Yeah. Well, I know we already fed you a meal earlier in the show, but you might still be hungry. Uh, and if so, Kellogg's has good news for you because the company has partnered with food service robotics company Chowbotics to create something called the Kellogg's Bull Bot, which lets you custom mix multiple cere cereals together. Yes, it's a robot cereal maker. And if you want to get extra wild, you could add things like chocolate, fruits and nuts, yogurt, even syrup. 
The bowl bot will first serve students at Florida State University and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Some pre-selected combos include Snap, Crackle, Pop, 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 which is Cocoa Krispies, Rice Krispies, Hemp, Pumpkin, and Espresso Syrup. Or you might prefer Hawaii Five-O, a frosted mini wheats, bare naked triple berry granola with pineapple, coconut, and mango bowl, which might be delightful and it might cause you intestinal distress. Who cares? <laughs> it's fun. Bowls start at $2.99 and go up to $6.50 with lots of extra toppings. And I just can't, I, I can't give enough kudos to whoever was like, you know where we should test this? A college dorm. Right. <laughs> I mean, when I was in college, which granted, uh, you know, was during the first Bush administration, uh, I would have gone nuts for this. I would have used this every day. If this had been in the in the, the dorm cafeteria, I absolutely would have been creating a different recipe uh, every day just to try it out. Because I essentially oh, yeah. was doing, you know, back in my day, you just had the big plastic bins and you had to make your own creations. Now kids today, they got robots doing it for them. It's great. I'd be more than happy to mix up some cereal, even though I'm 35 years old. They can put one of those in my house. I use Lucky Charms and like Frosted Cheerios and all sorts of good stuff every single day. So if they want to mix up some of that up and use me as a guinea pig, I'm more than happy to help. Yeah, same. Cereal, fruits and nuts, yogurt. It's great. It's a balanced We're breakfast. We're seeing more all the and things. more of, the, of this technology, this sort of like robotic sorting technology that can be a little smarter than a, and a purely mechanical vending machine. Uh, and I, and I love that. I, I, I love, you know, the, I guess the first one I ever encountered the wild was the, the universal soda machine where it, it was using the robotic system to mix the carbonated water and the syrup, uh, in a way that it could mix your sweetener and your syrup at the same time. So you could get caffeine free, sugar free versions of everything. You just, you picked your flavor and whether you wanted caffeine and sugar or not, uh, and it would do that. Now they've taken it even farther. We've we've seen the the stories about salad bowls and 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 restaurants being able to do this, and now the universal cereal machine. What's next? Can't wait. <laughs> All right, let's stuff. check out the mailbag. Let's do it. We got a few emails about our discussion yesterday with Justin Robert Young about those who buy Blu-ray games spending more overall on games but less on add-ons. Mike and Dusty Dubai in particular wrote in and said, I'll buy a PS5 with a disc drive eventually. I bought my PS4 a little over a year ago on sale. It was bundled with some games that I was interested in. It'll be a few years before I buy a TV that would benefit from the more powerful PS5. And I love that Sony is releasing games for both systems and will allow buyers to have an upgraded version of the game when they move to a new system. Um, Mike says, the reason I'll dish out more for the drive is I'm cheap. I rarely buy games on release day. I wait for them to go on sale within a few months. I rarely pay more than $20 for a game. If I end up saving money by getting physical copies of games for a fraction of the price, the more expensive version is worth it. The analysis that people buying the Blu-ray drive version spending less to uh, in total makes sense. Uh, Nick, Frank, and Nicholas all wrote in with similar uh, emails as well. Uh, and uh, I, I assume we, we could have done a better job of, of clarifying this story. Uh, but Mike said the analysis that people buying the Blu-ray drive version spend less totally makes sense to me. I think is missing, maybe not, that the story was that PS5 owners with Blu-ray spend 17% more on actual game titles. The reason they spend less overall is because they spend less on add-ons. Add-ons. But 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 Mike and several other people, I and I and I think you know, they represent a, a section of people who are like, yeah, no, I, I get the discs because I can save money. I can buy used copies. Uh, I can get I can get things on sale. Nick I, was telling us it's different in Australia that the the uh, the disc copies are often sold at less than the digital copies. But y'all with the Blu-ray discs are spending more on the actual titles. So it's the opposite of being able to to save money. It's just that you're not spending on the add-ons later. So I'm curious. I'm curious if you have a perspective on why that is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if you have a perspective or you have a thought on anything that we talk about on the show, send it to us. Share your knowledge. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. We'd like to shout out patrons at our master and our grandmaster levels. Today, they include Brandon Brooks, Tim Ashman, and High Tech Oki. Also, we asked very nicely yesterday, and our brand new boss, Brandon, not Brandon Brooks, a brand new Brandon, just started back at us on Patreon. We said we'd shout you out, Brandon, and we are shouting you out. Thanks for making our weekend bright already. Brandon was smart. 
Yesterday we said, look, you want your name in the show. All you got to do is back us on Patreon. You're in the show tomorrow. Yeah. Brandon, Brandon knew what was up. you shall receive. Yeah. Good job, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. All right, let's thank Len Peralta as well, who has been drawing for today's show. Uh, what have you drawn for us today, Len? Oh, you know, I feel like I missed out on trying to draw the cereal bot. I feel that would have been perfect, <laughs> but I, it was a kicker story. I didn't know if it was going to be on, but I, but, but I ended up going with the, with the Have I Been Pwned because I just thought that was a funny name, and, uh, and the image is of a gentleman who's thinking, hey, Have I Been Pwned? I'm sure I'm safe. Meanwhile. He's got his date of birth, his mother's maiden name, his social security number, and his passport <laughs> all printed on his face and his hand. So uh, he has been pwned. He's just He's not also aware. wearing a sash that says pwned. <laughs> Somebody put a sash on him that said pwned. <laughs> he doesn't even know it's there. And he has a big L on his head. Not that if you've been pwned, you're an L, but unfortunately, you know, you that's the way you feel. But uh, if you'd like to see this image, you can go over to my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. It's right there for you. If you're a Patreon backer, you can download it. You can also go to my online store at lenperaltastore.com. Also, uh, before the show, if you want to watch me do this, uh, draw this live, you go to twitch.tv forward slash Len Peralta and watch it live and uh, and and kind of make, sh you know, just kind of be a part of it. Be a part of the uh, of the fun. So check it out, everybody. Thank you, Len. Also, thanks to Shannon Morse for being with us today. Shannon, I know you're real busy. You got videos coming out all the time. Where can people find your work? <laughs> I always do. In fact, my studio build for construction is almost done. So hopefully by the next time I'm on the show, you'll see a brand new studio behind me. Uh, but Today, I just wanted to give a shout out to my my fellow co-hosts on Hack5, youtube.com slash Hack5. We just hit 700,000 subscribers, and for a hacker channel, that's a that's pretty awesome. YouTube hasn't canceled us, so I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> yeah, lo long deserved. A lot of long, long years and hard work gone into that. So congratulations to you and Darren and everybody over there. That's awesome. Thank you. We are live on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're out Monday for the Memorial Day holiday in the U.S., but we're back Tuesday with Allison Sheridan. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Intern, Dr. Nicole Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, WScottis1, BioCow, Captain Kipper, and Jack Shid. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Creative Vast Arts. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Shannon Morse. Guests on this week's show were Nate Langson. Live art performed by Len Peralta. And thanks to all our Patreons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>